of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, speaking of love <laughs> and fanny packs, welcome <laughs> to the American Sci-Fi Classics track. It is Thursday night. Um, it's 2021. It's 2021. Yeah. Guys, congratulations. We survived. I, I, I don't. I think it's still 2020 and it's all a mirage. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah like, we are on December thirty seventh, twenty twenty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like kind of like how the the eighties, the nineties were still the eighties for mm. like three years. Mm -hmm. So I think we're kind of we're kind of in that in that realm mm -hmm. right now. But today we're gonna go back in time thirty years to the debut of. Uh, a movie that I think maybe people thought was it where they were they were going to be like a zillion of these, uh, <laughs> but uh, there was only one, and that movie is Dick Tracy. Yes, yay! Yes, and uh, of course Dick Tracy, before, prior to the movie, had been around for a bajillion years in mm -hmm. comic strips and movies and cartoons in the '60s and uh, live action TV series briefly. Uh, but the, everyone remembers now the Dick Tracy movie. And I don't think, except for the continuing TV, uh, continuing comic strip, which has kept going every day for 80 years, something like that. Um, <laughs> there's been nothing new in the Dick Tracy world since this movie, but we're going to talk about all those things with my August with our August panel of learned Dick Tracy individuals. Uh, Would you say we're Dickensian? Oh. Oh, no. No, nope. no, get Gary. out. Gary. Boom. Okay. So, <laughs> Denise, Keith. Uh, oh, my God, you actually did it. <laughs> Denise, Keith. Denise, tell us uh, where you're from and uh, what do you do? <laughs> So uh, where I'm from is actually kind of a loaded question. I'm a military brat. I was born overseas, raised overseas, and hopped across the country, this country specifically, uh, for most of my life. Now I'm in Alabama. I'm a uh, freelance artist and... Uh, Oh, goodness. Sorry. It's cold and my nose is just... Oof. Anyway, I'm a, I'm a freelance artist and... Um, well, I've got a degree in media arts and animation anyway. Uh, but by day, I work for the United States Army as a uh, DA civilian, and I'm a program manager. Um, that little fun banner right there, you can find me on Instagram at layman's terms and uh, catch up with all of my stuff. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. And uh, one internet south of uh, you and me, Mr. Keith R.A. DeCandido. Hello. Uh, yes, I am Keith R.A. DeCandido. I write things. Um, people then turn around and publish things that I write, and then people oh, read the things that I write. Yes. Um, I've written fiction. I've written comic books. I've written short stories. I've written novels. I've written criticism, all sorts of stuff. Um, most relevant to this particular topic is uh, I've been doing on Tor.com uh, the Great Superhero Movie Rewatch. Uh, in which I have covered every single live action movie based on a superhero comic book. I have defined superhero very loosely, which <laughs> means that I uh, have included a bunch of, of things, including Dick Tracy, not only the Warren Beatty film, but also the four 1940s uh, films. Yeah, yeah. The 1940s films were so much fun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we'll get to that. Yes. We will get to uh, that. And it, it, the, the Dick. I, I basically let Dick Tracy in on the same theory that he's as much of a superhero as Batman is in a lot of ways. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, welcome back. My <laughs> dragon con American sci-fi classics co-director, <laughs> Mr. Gary Mitchell. How are you, sir? Prime wants words with you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> so what, I am what, uh, if you'll, if you'll allow me, if you'll pardon me for a second, I, I would like to announce here live on the whole thing. Oh, I was going to do Gary that. Go were, for yeah, me and Gary were invited back for 2021 to be the American Sci-Fi Classics co-directors. Yay! So, breaking news, so, so the, we're, we're, so, stay, so we're the, staying. We're staying here. Yay! Thank you. 
The bribes <laughs> continue to hold. Yes. <laughs> and the negatives are still learn their lesson. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the negatives are still secure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. The the negatives are still in the dark room with the water and yep. and and everybody under the age of forty is like, what's a negative? Huh? What? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You see, back in the day, kids, there's a stuff called film. <laughs> film. That's what we called it. Yes. So, so for for reasons that have nothing absolutely to do with uh, with me and my elucidation, what are the bribes again this year? A lot of questions. We'll talk, we're, we're we'll talk in those. private. We'll talk. In well, private. Yeah, yeah. No, we'll um, we're working on this. <laughs> it's a new year. Yeah. We got we got lots of th lots of things. Right. So, you know, Dick Tracy. What? <laughs> When Dick Tracy came out, for me, um, for the year leading up to it, in all my comic books, was just the silhouette of Warren Beatty saying, I'm on my way. And that was like a year in every comic book. And it was one year after Batman 1989. And I thought, hey, we're going to get one superhero-ish movie every year. That's crazy. <laughs> and you can't sustain that. No, there's no way you could do more than one superhero movie per year. Uh, but Dick Tracy was what we got a year after <laughs> Batman 89. And did you guys see it in the theater or <laughs> did you guys see it um, on VHS or where did you guys see it first? <clears throat> Um, um, so, <laughs> uh, being the youngest one in this group, I actually stumbled upon it, um, not too long ago, a couple, three, four, maybe, maybe six or seven years ago. I don't really remember. Time, time is immaterial. It's a blur. It really yeah. is. Um, I stumbled upon it on Apple TV, not Apple TV, but you know, Apple when, when they were doing the thing. And I I picked it up and I started watching it and it was the best acid trip I ever went on <laughs> <laughs> without actually doing acid. <laughs> yeah, kind of is. It was a great movie. I fell in love with it. I bought it immediately after. I was like, oh my god, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> Did um, I, I, you know, I actually saw the movie in the theater when it was released. That was right after I graduated college. Oh. Uh, it was released in June of 1990. I graduated college in May of 1990, and I went to see it with my then fiance, later, later wife, later ex wife, um, and and it was. It may have even been the first movie I actually saw in a theater as like an adult, um, mm -hmm. as a as a college graduate. Um, and I think you know a bunch. A bunch of us went to see it. Uh, my Marina, my my then fiance, and me, and some friends of ours all went out because we were all excited about it. We were all comic book nerds, and we we, we wanted to go see it. And it looked like it was going to be fun, so we did. Mm -hmm. Gary, what about you, sir? Uh, I did see it in the theaters as well. I had not graduated from college. Uh, I had barely graduated from high school. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm old. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I remember going to see it in the theater. And the theater I went to go see it at, they had this long hallway you had to go down to get into the actual theater. And they put up black light wanted posters of the different classic Dick Tracy villains. And that was pretty cool. What um did you guys but after having watched Batman? I was excited. Oh, this is gonna be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is like hey, this is the second, like what we're 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 two years in a row. We're doing comic book stuff two years in a row. Uh, I was familiar with Dick Tracy from comic strips, from mm -hmm. the daily comic strips, but I remember utterly disliking them because <laughs> hey. That's not the Phantom. Come on, there's no Phantom. Uh, but uh, it it just the I, I don't know. There was something about Dick Tracy that never appealed to me until years later when mm -hmm. I looked back at the big collections of the classic strips and I saw them all at once and I was like, oh, now I get it. It That's was a lot like, it, yeah, it was a lot like the 1950s and 60s Batman comics mm -hmm. um, to me. 
so th then I got it. But reading just three panels every day for like my entire childhood, <laughs> from like age zero to ten, I didn't know what was going on. I had I, I didn't I didn't get it. I get it now. I got it then. But um, but the movie though, like Gary, I saw it um, mid college, and um, with. I don't know that I saw it with a bunch of people, but I came out of it going, well, that was super weird. <laughs> and then I went and bought the soundtrack on cassette <laughs> because Madonna, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, that's my biggest memory of this movie. Why? Why is that? What? Because your brain is weird, Joe. Well, <laughs> yes. thank you. I think, uh, I think Dick Tracy, if, if you look, just look at the movie aesthetically, I think the best part of that movie and the reason why it sticks out in so many people's memory, because it sticks out in mine too. I, I love this stupid little movie so much. It's ridiculous. Uh, but I think the reason why it sticks out in people's minds is because it's so weird, because they, the, they took care to make it look like the comics which up until that point, I don't know as though it had ever really been attempted before. I mean, you have Batman, but Batman is like a dressed up New York, basically. So you don't really have to, you don't really have to imagine too much to have Gotham in your head, right? But with Dick Tracy's world, it's so stylized in the comics and it's got that wonderful 40s look to it. Still to this day, it's got a great 40s look to it. And they tried so hard to put that comic look into visual medium that it just, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's an acid trip, bright colors, oversaturation. It's like that Speed Racer movie. Holy crap, yeah. you guys see that movie? It's fantastic, I love that movie. There's a double feature. So, do you want to speak to that? Um, um, well, well, it's interesting actually because there was another comic book movie that came out the same year, which also uh, really dove into uh, aping the visuals more than other ones had previously, which was the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. Yeah, ah, yeah. Both, both of those were the first ones really to embrace the entire aesthetic of the comic book that mm -hmm. it was based on, Agreed. like the. the the Superman movies, you know, Christopher Reeve, yes, actually looked like Superman, but nothing else looked like like the comic book. Every it, the rest of it looked like New York. Um, you know, the the Batman didn't look like any real city, but what it looked like was a Tim Burton movie more than it looked like something out of the comic book, which was fine. That worked, you know, it worked for that film. Um, you know what what Beatty did, and and what they also did in the Turtles movie was really adapt the entire look of it. Um, yeah, in the case yeah. of the turtles, they were able to do it because with through the Jim Henson Creature Shop. With with Dick Tracy, they really and part of it was the technology had gotten to the point where they could. Um, mm -hmm. This was, you know, I mean, this was this the the, the quality of the film that they were able to work with, uh, and and the quality of the of the set design was such that they were able to pull it off. What's interesting is that Beatty had been trying to do a Dick Tracy film since 1975. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, a huge fan of the character. Yeah, uh, but the rights <laughs> were, already, were were already taken, um, and the problem that, that they were having making a film. Nineteen seventy five was a much better time to make a Dick Tracy film than nineteen ninety because the character was was more in the. But by nineteen ninety, the character was not as much in the public consciousness. Throughout the fifty, throughout the forties, fifties, and sixties, Dick Tracy. Everybody knew Dick Tracy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it, average average person on the street knew exactly who Dick Tracy was. By nineteen ninety. But by 90, uh, Chester Gould had retired from the strip in the 70s, and he died in 1985. Mm -hmm. And once he was no longer doing it, it wasn't quite as popular, unfortunately. But um, uh, Beatty was like he'd, he'd been trying to get the rights constantly, and he finally the the biggest uh, stumbling block to making a film was Chester Gould, who uh, didn't really <laughs> like anything that anybody was doing with it. After he died, it got a lot easier to get his approval. So uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, and and Beatty really wanted Beatty, this was this was a passion project for Beatty. It really mm -hmm. was. Well, and, and he to do a sequel. Um, yeah. Well, at least he did in 2016 after he finally got the rights back after that nasty legal battle. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I mean, 
I, I, I want him to do a sequel because now he can. They can just cake him in the same makeup that they used on Pruneface and everybody else. Yeah. And they can just make him make him same age as he was 30 years ago. It's easy. That was the other, that was the other thing that the, the movie did, which, which the movie serials in the 40s didn't do and which the, the theatrical releases in the 40s didn't do was really – Chester Gold was so good at drawing grotesqueries, you know, yeah. really creepy looking yeah. people. And the only – like in, in, in the previous screen versions, the only character who really looked like a Chester Gold drawing was Boris Karloff because he already kind of looks like that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Um, but I feel like I feel like uh, what they did, and and there's a reason why Dick Tracy won that special Edgar Award um, because you know Chester Gold was so good at what he did. Um, but I feel like with the 1990s movie, that's one thing that they really, really did a good job with was the grotesqueries, as as weird and as shocking as it looks. It actually feels like you're in a comic book. The only mm -hmm. thing that they're really missing is the white border. <laughs> yeah. well, that was the main thing I remember from before the movie came out was watching all the behind the scenes. I'm a huge behind the scenes fan. I love all those documentaries and behind the and that special features and all that. And they were talking about how they wanted every, you know, if there was going to be a cab, it was going to be a bright, bright yellow cab. Mm -hmm. They put up lights along the the along the the ground to make the bricks of the buildings bright bright red mm -hmm. it was like they wanted that full four color pop which like it was, was in, a, in a sunday comic strip yeah 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 exactly yeah. yeah it's like the only thing they didn't do was draw little dots on everybody <laughs> yeah the half tones but yeah i mean there's a lot to love about this movie in that the production design it won an oscar for the for the makeup it it stands out mainly because of all that. It tend, for me, it tends to fall apart everywhere else. I mean, no, I think it was it was the acting was amazing. Oh yeah, it was. It was. Um, but I think, and and I can I can agree with you, Gary. I mean, it it <laughs> it kind of does fall apart. I mean, it's really a nostalgia kind of movie. It's it's one of those that you just grab a bag of popcorn and you just watch. Mm -hmm. I think the one thing that I can appreciate about the 40s versions, and if you have the classics, and that's classic with an X app on your Apple TV or Roku or whatever, um, you can find the 40s versions of Dick Tracy. And the one thing I really, really, really super appreciated was all the labels that they put on everything. I really love that. And the, and the names that they did, the puns, I just... Oh, I, nah. Oh God! And they did. They put labels. It was like it was, uh, you know, the fifties. Uh, the Adam West Batman before Batman was was a thing, and it was just so funny and so much fun. And uh, my memory is failing me, but I don't know as though they ever made use of that in the nineties movies. And I really, really am kind of sad about that. But yeah. I think I think if you look at it from like okay a movie critic perspective yeah the movie absolutely it just it falls flat and it falls apart but if you just watch it to have fun it's super fun oh yeah <laughs> and Madonna is fantastic <laughs> oh yeah oh gosh um they, uh... everybody everybody in the movie who isn't um also the director of the film was brilliant yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know uh the the there was there was a great uh story uh william goldman wrote a book a couple of books about movie making including one called what lie did i tell and he talked about the experience of doing uh a movie called the ghost in the darkness and uh working with michael douglas on that michael douglas was, was the producer of the film and then and he was great to work with absolutely wonderful and then he decided to cast himself in a role that was not part of the original screenplay and then all of a sudden, Michael Douglas was no longer the producer of the film. He was the star of the film. And it completely changed everything. That mm -hmm. At that point, suddenly everything was about Michael Douglas, the actor, instead of what was best for the film. And it mm -hmm. completely warped and ruined the film. And I think of that every time I watch Dick Tracy, because as a director and as a writer, he does a good job. He, he adapted... The, the, the screenplay he used is, base, is a rewrite of the original 1975 one that Tom Mankiewicz wrote. Mm -hmm. And uh, and as a director, he does an amazing job. And and he, you know, the cinematographers he worked with—I don't remember who did that—but the 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 filming on that was great. 
but his performance is just nowhere. Mm -hmm. He's a yeah, that's the that's the biggest problem is if he had made the movie in the seventies, I think it would have worked better. Mm -hmm. Maybe he would because he would have uh, he would have well for one thing he would have been younger he would have fit the character mm -hmm. a little better. But yeah, maybe he wouldn't. You know, he would have been Warren Beatty. He'd have been Warren Beatty, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he does. He does. he absolutely he's a brick in the movie. Like everybody else around him, especially Al Pacino, is fantastic. Oh, yeah. I know who doesn't look. Yeah, Pacino's having an absolute ball. Oh, he is. Oh, oh my yeah. god. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, that is one of the first movies where Pacino just says, "You know what? I'm going for it." <laughs> it's like um, that Dungeons and Dragons movie with what's his face? Um, yeah, Jeremy yeah. Irons. He's hamming the crap out of the movie, and you can tell. But it's great because it adds that energy to it. And I still watch that stupid Dungeons and Dragons movies just for that performance because it's fantastic. Oh, yeah. That's a whole other panel that we definitely know, will get right? to. Uh, I, I think that's Deanna posting as Revolution SF. So we see your test, Deanna. Hey, thanks, Deanna. Uh, but we... Um, but yeah, but everybody else in the movie is fantastic. I mean, oh, yeah. I remember at the time people savaged Madonna, but they could, that was at a point where everybody was savaging everything everybody she was did. was super on her back about yeah. um, Justify My Love and about her mm -hmm. sex book and all that stuff for some crazy yeah. reason. Oh, did they yeah, not? But, you know, she was fantastic in Evita. Come on. Mm -hmm. Seriously. I love that movie. Yeah, but she is really good. Um the lady who played the girlfriend Tess, she was good. Glenn Headley mm. was amazing. Sure. Mm. Yeah, she oh, was. I see. Okay, all right. I, do, she, I didn't she was one of the best parts with Tess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because she oh. she she wasn't she she didn't play Tess as just a a, a shrinking violet as just the girlfriend. She she was she had she had some 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 bite to her. It was, it was she did. She was great. It was it was a phenomenal. What's interesting is they originally cast John Young, Young in the role. Oh. Um, Ooh. Yeah, and, and <laughs> we all then, went, Ooh, what? well, yeah. I mean, at the time they said that she was too difficult to work with. In in looking thirty years back, I suspect it's it, that may have been it, or it may have just been that you know she didn't do everything Warren Beatty wanted her to do. Shall we say? I mean, that could have yeah. probably been it. Um, I, I, I yeah, um, but you know, yeah. uh, but Headley was 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 superb. Oh, um, she was, and, and 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 yeah, every I mean, everybody was having. You could tell everybody was having fun with it, including Madonna, except um, for Warren Beatty. Except for Warren Beatty, <laughs> Warren Beatty was like, "This is my thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm going hard." On, it's on like this weird that this was gonna make his career somehow. Mm -hmm. like, dude, mm -hmm. oh, it was oh, Oscar pretty already well made at that point, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, they start out with Sandy. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, Tom Morris in reference. the comments says yeah. that uh, Beatty actually wanted Gibson or Cruz as Dick Tracy, and that would have been something. Hmm. Tom Cruise is Dick Tracy. Huh. It would have hmm. been interesting. Uh, maybe Tom Cruise specifically. Yeah. 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 It's crazy oh. that I, I really can't see anyone else playing Dick Tracy now other than yeah. Warren Beatty, though. Yeah, and the, that's it. And it's for kind of the wrong reason because Warren Beatty <laughs> just did not. Actually, you know, you know who would have been perfect? Mm. And and still, th well, he's too old at this point, but Kevin Costner. Kevin Costner oh, yeah. at the time would have been great. He pretty much played Dick Tracy in The Untouchables. I mean, the, El yeah. the, the way he played Elliot West <laughs> was, 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 that was Dick Tracy. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, because Dick, Dick Tracy, you need. Hmm? He's the straight man, you know. Yeah. You yeah. need that. that you need someone like Chris Evans as Captain America. Right. You yeah, do. Yeah. You need because somebody who is, you know, noble, pure, without being obnoxious about it. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he is that, you know, the straight by the book cop without being a prick. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you would have needed. And that's some... hard to pull off. It is. And... But I think Kevin Costner could have done it. I never yeah. thought about this uh, uh, until. Um... You guys brought it up, but really, Dick Tracy has to be the least interesting person in the Dick Tracy story. And um, Warren Beatty pulled that off, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, this is this is kind of a uh, and 
kind of a way inside goofy reference, but on the Dick Tracy cartoon in the 60s, which our buddy Kevin Eldridge showed us at Dragon Con a couple of years ago, in the theme song, they say, Dick Tracy, he's a good cop. That's it. Not a great cop, not the best cop. Yeah. He's, he's okay. Yeah. Well, he's not it. Batman, is he? He's, he's not Batman. Not Batman. He's and just Dick, Batman. Dick Tracy's just a guy. Mm-hmm. And everyone else, it, I think everyone else seems weirder because Dick Tracy is such a normal cat. Well, and that's it. And they could have played it. I mean, and I think they tried to play that in the movie. I just don't think it came off the right way because you're right. I mean, Dick Tracy is so normal and he's okay. And then everybody else around him is just so weird. So yeah, you attach to Tracy because he's kind of like the anchor in this weird little universe (laughs) of uh, alliterative names and ridiculous plot lines and everything. So you do attach to Dick Tracy because he's normal. <laughs> he's not yeah. the best. He's not the worst. He's just in the middle. He's okay. Exactly. He's a good cop. He's yeah. okay. He's satisfactory. Well, it, it depends on. I mean, I think I think he's at his most interesting, and and this this is what Beatty didn't do was oh, there's Michael. Um, was he's. He's focused. He's, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. he's the, he always gets who he's going after. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, the, the, Beta didn't really give us that. He just sort of gave him this guy, uh, <laughs> you know, because uh, he should, because he, he honestly, he should be a great, a great detective. He should mm-hmm. be, you know, somebody who, who is relentless, who doesn't give up. And the script provided that, but the actor didn't. In, yeah. in the yeah. Yeah. Well, well, and kind of touch off uh, what Tony uh, Tony N said in the comments, he's very much off of the same vein as the Untouchables. He's that he's going after the mob cop. He he's that Elliot Ness type. Yeah, you mm-hmm. know he he's you know he's a dog with a bone. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's welcome in one of our buddies, one of our regulars here on the American Sci-Fi Classics track, Mr. Michael Bailey. Hi, Michael. Yeah, my uh, my watch radio wasn't working, so it, it took me all the way up there. I apologize for that. Um, and I look terrible to, in yellow. Yeah, mm. you had to get into a giant yellow cab to get it. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie Cor- Charlie Corsmo was driving. It was a whole thing. All he wanted to talk So, so Dick no, Tracy, I'm- tell us, uh, tell it, tell, tell us your connection, your reaction to the Dick Tracy movie. Um. God, this thing wanted to be Batman 1989. Uh, But I was was really excited for it. Uh, I was uh, 14 that summer, and Comic Scene Magazine was covering Dick Tracy seemingly nonstop. And, uh, you know, they had comics, and they had, like, the the merchandising and the, the push for this movie was so humongous that... When I finally got to see it, I wasn't disappointed. And I was kind of afraid that by the time I got to it, it was going to be like, nope, nope, don't like it. Uh, and it, it it's remained like this movie that I have a lot of affection for. Uh, even when I watch it as an adult and notice certain things that I didn't notice at 14, that you would really think a 14-year-old would notice. Like Madonna. <laughs> Madonna. Like Madonna. <laughs> Jeez. Like, like like Madonna in a see-through shirt in a Touchstone movie. Now I know Touchstone was the Disney that dare not speak its name, but <laughs> but it was still Disney. So, but no, this thing, this I, I was like super excited for this. Uh, it, it didn't lead to like a lifelong love of Dick Tracy, uh, but it did lead to me like watching that terrible animated series. Oh, that yeah. Ran. I think it was Channel Nine out of New York that was running it that summer. I think uh, so, yeah. Where where Dick Tracy would come in at the beginning and hand it off to like a squirrel or a racial stereotype. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and it was, but no, I I I still love this movie. I I, I have nothing but a. I see where the problems are, 
Mm -hmm. And I do want to know how long Pacino had to spend in rehab getting all of the wood pulled out of his mouth from <laughs> chewing all of the scenery. All uh, of it. But, right. but that is still part of the attraction to me of this movie is how into it Pacino is. So, uh, yeah. yeah. People are talking about that too, how into yeah. it he got. <laughs> No, and Pacino, oh, yeah, was, yeah, Pacino, Pacino. Pacino was, you know, usually so, you know, restrained. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, sure. He was. I mean, well, well, early, yeah. Modern Pacino certainly has no idea what restraint is. Yeah, <laughs> but I well, like I mean, this. Is, this is still post, you know, post Serpico, post. Yeah, you know, yeah. He, 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 calmness is not exactly a mode he always uses. So, this I mean, is this is where they they gave him the 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 makeup and the goofiness and the Dick Tracyness of the whole thing, gave Pacino a license to just go full Pacino, which yeah. we had never seen before. So so is this Ground Zero or Patient Zero for for Screamy Pacino? <laughs> I think so. I think so. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. You're out of order. I'm out of order. The whole See, system's out of yeah. order. Yeah. No, I feel like I feel like we saw a little bit of Dick Tracy Pacino in Scarface Pacino. Mm. Oh, sure. Yeah. Just, yeah. just a, little bit, yeah. a little bit. We didn't see it in The Godfather. We didn't see it in The Godfather. No. Yeah, there no. in Michael Corleone. And 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 I was just I was just looking it up. Scent of a Woman w was actually after this when, mm. um, which was, <laughs> was I think it, <laughs> yeah that that I think was was peak shouty Pacino. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I do want to make uh, mention a comment that we also have from uh, Moss Eisley, Eisley, Moss Eisleyan Radio, uh, oh, talking about the it. novelization. Yes, which was by Max Allen Collins, who was yeah. who was writing the comic strip. At the mm -hmm. time. Uh, That's right, he was. Yeah, and he did for a while. He was Chester Gold's. He was handpicked by Chester Gold to take over the comic strip. Oh, was he really? I didn't. Yeah. Know that. Which he did what in like the mid to late seventies, I believe, is when he uh, came. Gold retired in the Gold retired in the seventies, yeah. And and yeah. and Collins was writing it for quite a while. Uh, certainly, mm -hmm. certainly while while throughout the throughout the eighties. And, and came in and basically undid all of the sixty stuff. If I'm remembering uh, what I've read about it uh, correctly, is that you know at, at one point Junior got married to a moon maid. Oh yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. it, so it, it it got a little crazy, and he kind of brought it back to uh, the more kind of down to earth, uh, uh, for Dick noir Tracy. type. Yeah, for Dick Tracy, <laughs> <laughs> down to earth for Dick Tracy. How was that pot in the sixties exactly? Yeah, no, no, there was there were. <laughs> It's like we got to go after. They're a hard boiled crime detective, but we got to go get flat top. <laughs> we got to go to the moon. <laughs> the moon. There was also a, a three-issue uh, prestige format comic book drawn by Kyle Baker, of all people. Oh, somebody. Uh, right. the yes, adapting it. Yeah, yeah, I d that had yeah. like a prequel and then adapted the, the movie and then did like kind of a sequel story as well. Oh. And the prequel is crazy. I mean, it is it is more like noir than the movie would ever be. So it gave me kind of this perception of what the movie was going to be. And then the movie didn't follow up on that, but that's not the comics fault. Uh, yeah. But it was basically like what was going, it, it shows like breathless coming to town mm. uh, as this innocent waif. Uh, and it was, <laughs> it was, it was really a really like, like a, you know, depression era crime story. Hmm. And then this movie happened, which is, Kind of the '90s version of what Robert Rodriguez did with the Sin City movies mm. uh, in, yeah. in the 2000s, yeah. with uh, paint like painted backgrounds were a thing, but this kind of took it to the next level of yeah. making it look like a comic book or a comic strip. Yeah, yeah, we were talking about that mm. earlier. Yeah. That, that, <laughs> that this, this was 1990 was really when they first started uh, when you first started seeing comic book adaptations that really embraced it to, to, to the same degree. Part of yeah, it was, instead of trying to run away from yeah. the comic book order. And or, I did not make that connection until you guys mentioned it. But yeah, this one really tried to not not so much duplicate, but to adapt mm -hmm. and to make uh to pull into live action the the whole Dick Traciness of the whole thing. And I 
appreciate that now more. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess I didn't at the time. I don't know. Yeah, um, you, can't, you can't really put Dick Tracy. You can't dict- uh, You can't take Dick Tracy in his form in the comic books with the hat and the trench and, you know, the yellow because Dick Tracy will forever be synonymous with yellow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't take him and put him in a modern for the time, I guess, for the 90s or I mean, you can't you can't even really put him in the 40s in the 50s. You can't do that with Dick Tracy because it wouldn't be Dick Tracy. Dick Tracy has a certain aesthetic, he has a certain feel, he has a certain Dick Tracyness that you you really have to take from the strip and put into your movie or your adaptation, whatever it is that you want to do, you you have to because otherwise, yeah. it's not Dick Tracy. Yeah, it, it's got to be that prohibition era gangster film, mm-hmm. just with grotesqueries, as, as Keith says. Yeah. And were, were was Dick Tracy? Were Dick Tracy's villains the inspiration for Batman's villains later? Because they were all that was all about at the same time. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, but, you know, but, it was, but, it was it, and 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 you know, it was is as much a product of of early to mid twentieth century belief that you know if you're ugly you must be you must be evil. Yeah. yeah. You know. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, you saw that you saw that in uh, you saw that in lots of comic strips at the time, and you saw it in in movies of the time too. Yeah. You know, if you're a monster on the inside, you're a monster on the outside. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Or the other yeah. way around. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Here's a. Uh, our, fr- our buddy Tom says the first cut was three hours long. I want to oh, see give that. me the baby cut. <laughs> yeah, I want that cut. I'd watch that. <laughs> I'm going to contact Disney Plus and tell them, A, to put it on Disney Plus, and then, B, we want the Disney cu- We want the, the baby cut. Yeah. <laughs> baby. Release the baby cut. No. <laughs> oh, if nothing God. else comes out of this, I want that hashtag. Hashtag <laughs> release the baby cut. No, yeah. it's it's probably on a reel-to-reel in Warren Beatty's garage somewhere. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, he he's attached to it. I mean, he did that thing That's with Leonard thing. Moulton a couple years ago to keep the... Uh, to keep the 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 copyright, did you guys did you guys know about this? I Lay it on like, us, Tell us about this. I feel like I remember it, but I missed it. When, yeah, whenever it, I forget what year it was, but Warren Beatty dressed as Dick Tracy and did an interview with Leonard Moulton as this like uh, short film, whatever you want to call it, just so he could hang on to his option, basically. Nice. So, so, yeah. that, so that it wouldn't expire and that somebody wouldn't come along and, and do another movie. And it's just like, like you can find it on YouTube. It's it's crazy because it's not like Warren Beatty is being interviewed about playing Dick Tracy. No, he is Dick Tracy being interviewed by Leonard Moulton. So it's kind of like that uh, uh, Corman for, uh, Fantastic Four film that they made purely to keep the rights. Yes. Okay. Well, here's what I'm going to do in our show notes for sure. I'm going to link to that to a YouTube of that because I remember meaning to watch it and never did. So I'll be watching it for the first time along with the rest of I it. didn't know that existed and I'm kind of afraid to watch it. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 like, what I, it's like, what I, I don't want to say it's like beyond the pale, but you got to appreciate his commitment to the bit. That uh, exactly. Nothing else. I mean, it's just. You know, for somebody, it's it's really weird that for someone that that was so passionate about this, he didn't really like you guys were talking about. He didn't do anything to really make himself like everybody else looked like the strip, but yeah. he didn't. Like, like I'm Warren yeah. Beatty wearing a coat, man. Yeah, yeah. That's it. he's he's and, and playing. And not only that, one one of the things I, uh, jumping on something Denise said, which which I think is true, is that it very much has the aesthetic of a particular time and place. And a lot of the casting really worked in that regard, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, Seymour Castle and Charles Durning are, you know, they, they look like they stepped out of a 40s James Cagney movie all the time. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. um, and they, they played with the cops. Um, Madonna is doing, you know, a classic chanteuse of the era. Uh, uh, um, 100%. You know, uh, Paul Sorvino and James Kahn are, gosh, playing gangsters. Um, <laughs> yeah, because that's a stretch for them. I know. Um, and 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 Glenn Headley is basically doing Tess Trueheart as Noel Neal's Lois Lane mixed with uh, Rosalind Russell's Hildy Hildy uh, Johnson. 
It's and and Al Pacino is is playing Scarface, yeah. and Michael Corleone together. He just mushed pretty them. much, yeah, yeah, and yeah. and with, so with, with ridiculous makeup. Yeah, yeah, with ooh, yeah, mm. and, and props to Dick Van Dyke for being a villain. Yeah, I mean, for, for turning yeah. out. Yeah, for, for turning out to be one of the bad guys. That's that's kind of against type for him, and it he, is. But he and, didn't have an accent, so that's a good thing. <laughs> 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 Who is your, um, we, uh, I, I, I don't want to uh, go too far inside baseball on this, but we, and we'll, we'll, we'll get him eventually. A friend of ours uh, told us about a, one of the makeup artists on Dick Tracy, and he couldn't make it tonight, but oh. we're going to get him eventually. We're going to get him for sure. And get it, because he did make up on Star Trek and some other stuff. Oh, but, we're gonna get, yeah. but we couldn't get him tonight, but he's Doug, Doug's a good guy. Go around the horn, and what's your favorite makeup job on in the in this movie? Because it's such a big part. Mine is Al Pacino's makeup, one hundred percent. I loved how they got his look. I just every time I watch that movie, I'm just amazed with what they did and how they did it. But by far, it's Al Pacino for me in the movie. I um I'm gonna go with flat top because. When I found out uh, William Forsyth played Flat Top and Raising Arizona was like one of those movies that my family's embra embraced as much as we embraced like Catholicism. So <laughs> seeing that guy as Flat Top and then seeing that make, you know, like looking like, like he just literally reached into a Chester Gould drawing and drew that out. I just, I was so impressed with that. Gary, what about you? Makeup. I know. I well, Denise took mine. Uh, I I loved um, I loved uh, Al's big boy, uh, and after him, I think uh, Prune Face. I think they did a really good job of making a guy look like a Prune Face. <laughs> uh, Keith. Yeah, I, I. You guys took all of my possibilities there. I. I <laughs> I, I mean, I'd, I'd have to agree. I'm going to just cheat and, and agree with Michael. I, I, I thought Flat Top was, was the best. The yeah, he looked that, like he stepped right out of the comic. See, they yeah, didn't yeah. try. I think that was the main thing. It was, it was out of all of them, it, it, that one, most Forsyth looked more most like a Chester Gould drawing out of all of them. Uh, our friend Tony Ann Marini, she uh, jumps in and says, Mumbles, come on, guys. Mumbles was good. Oh, yeah, no, Mumbles was great, too. That was, I, I think that was more the performance than the makeup, though. Yeah. yeah. I feel like... I feel oh, like... I, small, I forgot about Small Face. Uh, <laughs> small Face. I forgot yeah. about Small Face, too. I did, too. He was good. I mean, they small were all... Small Face was good. That was, that was, was, that was really creepy good. as hell. I like that the... Was, that was, I mean, 1990 was the, was the heyday of, of, of ridiculous latex makeup. That was when, you know, mm -hmm. there were a lot of... You know, all, you had... Star Trek The Next Generation was on the air um, at that point, and you had Michael Westmore uh, doing all sorts of crazy stuff. You had the, the Jim Henson Creature Shop at the height of their uh, popularity. No, and, and you know, there were a lot of really good stuff. Yeah, and, Tim yeah, Burton and, was doing yes. not ruining Alice in Wonderland yet, of which I will right. never forget mm. him. But there, there, Super. that was, you know, that was, mm. that was, that was, that was the, 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 um, the height of the latex era. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, <clears throat> what? There's nothing wrong with that. No. Uh, yeah, wait, wait, someone wait, wait, has mentioned it. But... What did you think I meant? He says innocently. <laughs> yeah, Michael. Come on, guys. Yeah. yeah. And as someone mentions in the comments, they actually apparently did try to do to give Beatty that. Dick Tracy squared off nose and chin, but apparently he, uh, Beatty reacted poorly to the makeup. Oh, yeah. Me mm. Meaning he, he didn't want to wear it or <laughs> no, he I, broke out? I, the official story is a breakout. Yeah, I think he had the same reaction that John Reese davies did mm -hmm. when uh, he played Gimli. I yeah. think that was the reaction, yeah. so he didn't wear it. It's, it's okay because Alec Baldwin several years later decided I'm going to wear a latex nose no matter what in the Shadow movie. So. No matter what. <laughs> yeah. I'm doing it. I'm the Shadow. I don't care. He's got the nose, yes. man. I got the whole no, I got that nose. Exactly. 
The most random thought I had the last time I watched this film, though, was how there's like this weird musical theater connection mm -hmm. because you have you have Mandy Patinkin, who looks different in everything he does. Every <laughs> single thing. Sitting down and singing with Madonna. And it's like the Avita is uh, the Avita connection there is pretty strong because and he was Jay Brooklyn. on Broadway and then mm -hmm. she would eventually play it. So I don't know why that makes me happy, but it does. <laughs> um, but I like seeing Mandy Patinkin in anything. So, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah his 88 Keys is a great character. Mm -hmm. yeah. The thing is, he just kind of slipped in there with everybody else just going nut bonkers. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, there's Mandy Patinkin too. You know, it's a yeah. bonus. And I remember seeing an interview with him is that part of the whole reason he even took the role was he got to play piano. <laughs> yeah. I mean, can you blame him? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm. It's so funny. I just found I just found my cassette of the Dick Tracy soundtrack. And <laughs> oh wow. Here it breathless. is. That's right. I'm breathless. Show us that uh, Madonna picture there. Let's see right there. Look at that. Yeah, and With they, Dick that's Tracy looking thing right down her cleavage. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And we haven't mentioned the fact that those two were actually a, a couple at the time. Were they really? Yeah. yeah. For about yeah, 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. For about he's 10 in minutes. Her, uh, Truth or Dare movie. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, and that, well. and because all of her, I, I remember the scene or a scene, all of her dancers are kind of weirded out that Paw Paw is, is over in the corner. <laughs> and that's her boyfriend. Hey, what's, what's Pat Paw doing over there? No, but, I, um, I, I think the key to the casting of this film is: Were you friends with Warren Beatty at any point in your career? In which any case, point. you'll 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 bring it. I mean, Kathy Bates is in this for like five yes. seconds. Yes. Um, but Catherine O'Hara is in this movie for like a blink and you'll miss her. And, and I it, did not know that until yeah. I I, yep. I looked there. But uh, yeah, there's I um okay now they I'm going back to Rick Silva was also in it. I meant uh. Paul Sorvino, I mentioned also. Yeah. And, and oh, yeah, yeah. And Forsyth. Yeah, it was it was a ridiculous cast. And you oh, mentioned uh y'all 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 mentioned um um oh shoot. Kathy Bates and really? uh Charles Durning, my goodness. And Seymour Castle and yeah. Everybody's in there. You blink and oh, you yeah. miss well, and of again, course, it's Hoffman, so you know, because you gotta have that Ishtar thing going there. Estelle Parsons played Tess's mother. Yes. <laughs> You got a sweet, yeah, there's uh, some Golden Girl action going on in there, but this yeah, is it, the. It, uh, it was amazing how much pulp though Patey did have at the time. He was oh, yeah. on top of the world. He could pretty Why? almost get anything he wanted. Oh, hello! Why is this picture of Madonna in the cassette? I, I d <laughs> because it's 1990 era Madonna. Yeah, yeah that's what all of the pictures of Madonna looked like at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, this is the precursor to the book that would come out a couple years later. Well, yes. Yeah. Um, this is this is a, a a weird story. I was uh, I don't know if I'd been on a long streak of not going on dates of of or some reason, but my father said my father got my 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 father got me the sex book for mm. Christmas. <laughs> And I said, why? I said, thank you. But he said, I felt like you you needed it. I'm like, Dad, what are you talking about? <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> and to this day, I I, I don't know. But um, I just want to point out that my cassette tape of The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, which I actually found on the side of the road uh, when my dad and I were walking <laughs> in Bury St. Edmunds, England. No kidding. I found it on the side of the road. It was like laying there. I just want to point out that my cassette insert has nothing that exciting, and I'm kind of disappointing. Yeah, kind well of disappointing. Joe is known as Mr. Cassette Excitement. <laughs> <laughs> That's my middle name. Joe <laughs> Cassette name, Excitement yeah. Crow. So, did uh, I, you guys probably already answered this, but I'm going to ask it again either. Did any of you have the t shirt that got you into the midnight showing? I no, but someone in our comments did. Yes. Oh, okay. wow. What was the T-shirt? Was it just Dick Tracy going? I'm on it my had, way. It's no, it had um, Dick Tracy. It just had Dick Tracy written on it, didn't it? In the in the lo in the logo type. 
In, it was in, like in a yellow shirt yeah. with orange writing on it. Yeah, you know the 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 advertising for this movie is, you know, I, I joked before that they were trying to to redo Batman, uh, but I, I think that was actually to the to the films. Uh, not to the detriment of the film, but actually rather the opposite because it created like a stylized look like, you know, it was either, you know, uh, Dick Tracy looking at his watch or just that kind of profile shot. And that's all you needed because even in 1990, Dick Tracy was still a well-known figure. Yeah. And, you know, they, they had tried so many times between the movie serials and there was a pilot that the Batman producers did in the '60s. Very uh, appropriate, yeah. Which uh, <laughs> which had a very young Eve Plum as uh, Junior's little sister. Oh wow! I don't, I don't know how that worked, uh, but it was, it was it was like 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 it was like Batman, but with all the cool stuffs taken out. <laughs> that was what the Dick Tracy pilot was like. So you know, this was really their big chance, and. I still don't have like a firm grasp on why it didn't do better. Uh, I mean, it, it's not like, I mean, it was, what was it up against? Gremlins 2 and RoboCop 2? <laughs> Both very fine films, but at the same time, not really in the same realm. Well, I just remember when I saw it with my friends at the time when it came out, when we came out, we were kind of, our main feeling was kind of disappointment that there had been so much hype for it that we didn't feel it lived up to that hmm. was, and that we, you know, that, and I know from uh, my perspective is like all the cool things about Dick Tracy for me were the cool villains that look weird. And uh, most of them get killed off near the beginning of the movie. <laughs> um, yeah. just, just, just to be fair. Um, one of its major pieces of competition was total recall. No. Um, okay. Okay. And then, yeah. and then shortly afterward, you had Die Hard too. Um, yeah, that's true. And and Ghost. So yeah, there was there there, there was there was some there was some serious movies. One, there. one thing, that we and, and, another, and another forty eight hours came out in June. Mm. Um, ah. so it's not like it's not like there were no other good there were no other popular movies floating around. One thing that I literally forgot was attached to this movie was a Roger Rabbit short mm -hmm. cartoon. Yes. yes. Because they were trying to, video. they were trying to make short cartoons happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and it, uh, I think this was the only time that they did it. Yeah, and they, they started doing they it. They did it, the they do it every now and then. Yeah, they did it the previous year in front of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. They had a Roger okay. Rabbit yeah. short. Yeah, um, yeah after, after after Roger Rabbit, Dizzy was trying really hard to bring back <laughs> these short film. Well, and, and they forgot, they forgot, Disney had forgotten that the only real reason that those shorts worked back in the day is because uh, Walt had strong arm Technicolor into a five year contract. No oh. other studio could use Technicolor technology. So, and that's not to say that the Disney animation was bad. No, it's not. I have about four different books on Disney animation that they oh, had yeah. to buy in college because it is the standard of animation um, that you learn in school. But really what helped the Disney shorts or the short films was the fact that Walt had strong arm Technicolor into that contract. And so by the time uh, the contract was up and Technicolor could branch out to the other studios, Warner Brothers and the other smaller studios, nobody could compete with Disney because they had already been established and they were automatically thought of as better. They were brighter. There were more colors and things like that. And so Disney, I mean, they tried to make it work, but it they they kind of forgot what made it work in the first place. And it wouldn't necessarily be able to be replicated um, until, you know, Pixar started doing their shorts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also the, the movie going experience was 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 different. Yeah. You, know, you had you had you not only had the animated short, you also had the newsreel. That was where how a lot of people got their news was when we're going to the movies. Exactly. You know? And so the whole idea of a whole bunch of different things before the movie was more common, you know. Yeah. But it, basically before television. Yeah. And <laughs> the average film at the time was was barely over an hour, so yeah. doing a short yeah. film in front of it was not a big deal. Yeah. yeah. And 
the news of the world was uh, during wartime was how you kept up with what was going on in the different yeah. yeah, and and going to the theater was like an experience. You didn't just go to see your movie and go home. It was just like, like you guys said, there was the newsreels, and then there was the cartoon, and there was the first feature, then there was the second feature. Yeah, uh, it was a so, whole experience for people back yeah. then. Yeah. Now, Moss Isolating Radio, hello again, actually uh, was the one who had the shirt, and he actually gave us the information there. Yeah. Right. I remember. Wow. Yeah. The oh, okay. That's cool. Now I'm going to have to get one of those t-shirts. I feel like I need it. Like, yeah. T-shirt. Yeah. Yeah, that, that seems very on brand for you, too. So the, 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 yeah. I feel like, yeah, you have to now. Um, I don't I don't know. There's there's a comment that Sherman Burris made that that is uh, talking about the their similarities between uh, Dick Tracy and Lil Abner and what's oh. especially funny about that is that Lil Abner actually had a Dick Tracy parody strip as part of it called Fearless Fosdick. <laughs> oh, now I remember hearing about Fearless Fosdick. Yes, yeah. I Which, feel like didn't they? I I could be totally mistaken. <laughs> I feel like didn't they work Fearless Fosdick into Dick Tracy somehow? Like, didn't Dick Tracy make a reference to it, or like Fearless Fosdick's cousin? I feel, like, I feel like that happened. Maybe. I don't, I don't know. I don't remember now. It's been a very long time since I've actually thought about Fearless Fosdick. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a minute. I mean, they might have, but I don't know. I don't know either. I, I, I don't know why that struck me, but I, I remember in in a lot of my geek reading i feel like that came up but um but yeah little abner was uh well yeah. uh, probably all the comic strip cartoonists of the time all knew each other and i feel like they probably hung out at 3 a.m in bars <laughs> and a lot of them would get you know working in work with each other in different studios and stuff a lot of them came out of the eisner Iger studios and the, yeah, yeah. No, and i mean eisner you know he yeah. for god's sake he has an award named after him and um yeah. eisner also had the not I don't want to say Dick Tracy esque, but I, I can't think of a better way to describe it. But he also had a comic in line with the feel of Dick Tracy. Um, so yeah. I mean, it's it's not it's not unrealistic to to think that there were mentions made in the different comics. Yeah. I mean, it's completely possible because these these comics ran concurrently with each other. In the and, they were, and they were hugely popular. I mean, the 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 Gould wasn't thrilled with Fearless Fosdick, but he never said anything about it. Yeah. Um, he 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 didn't you know rip into it. Nobody you know, and and, and Lil Abner was hugely popular, and 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 uh, Dick Tracy was hugely popular. So mm-hmm. you know, one thing I I, 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 I um uh what I, what what I like is about Dick Tracy is that Dick Tracy still running today. Oh yeah, in, mm-hmm. in oh, yeah. newspapers. I mean, if there are. Um, physical newspapers where you are, Dick Tracy could be there. I the one day physical newspapers will be back. I swear it. Uh, but but uh, um, Dick Tracy's still there somewhere. And um, yeah, I think Joe fact, Staten's doing the artwork on it. Joe Staten, who's a comic book legend, exactly. Yeah. Um, think, unless I'm mistaken, and I could be mistaken, I think they actually have a collection of the original Dick Tracy comics in a book, like they do with Calvin and Hobbes and the old guys. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think it was IDW has been putting out these amazing collections of comic strips. They've done the same thing with, with Peanuts. And mm-hmm. uh, and and the now they're starting to dip into like the Batman and Superman strips of the 40s. Yeah. Uh, so the, cool, the, the coolest thing I remember about um, the, the Dick Tracy thing, comic strip, right at the end of our local newspaper where I worked, um, Little Orphan Annie had been discontinued and it ended on a cliffhanger and the Dick Tracy comic strip solved it. He oh. rescued Little Orphan Annie. Oh, and that, <laughs> so, that's so, awesome. so I pointed out in our comments, it's the original MCU style thing. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. Comic universe. The DTCU, if mm-hmm. you will. Yeah. <laughs> And I would love to see, uh, you know, Webtoon is incredibly popular. Um, I, I have Webtoon and I subscribe to a ridiculous number of comic books, to be honest with you. <laughs> I, I would actually love to see uh, Dick Tracy go on to Webtoon um, and kind of get get that audience back again because they are, they're great comics. And I feel like with the web, with the popularity of Webtoon and just the vast amount of 
different comics that you see on offer from Webtoon. Um, I feel like Dick Tracy would have a home and not just a home, but he would have an audience there. And I would love to see him come back on, on that platform. I would also love to see the shadow come back on that platform too, mainly because I, I want to read the shadow more and, and it's irritating that they make me go to different comic books to get the same friggin' or next chapter in the same friggin' story. And it drives me insane. <laughs> hey, drives Jim, me now I want that, the shadow Dick Tracy crossover. Come on, people. I, I am actually really surprised that somebody like IDW or um Black Horse or, or Dynamite Horse, hasn't, Horse, yeah. Yeah, Horse. hasn't Horse, basically sorry. licensed it into nice. Yes, yeah. Lore Olympus. Oh my god, sorry, sorry, Michael Honey. Lore Olympus. Oh yes. Anyway, continue, please. <laughs> That's okay. No, I'm, I'm surprised we haven't gotten like the future quest that DC did a couple years ago that that brought all like the Hanna Barbera cartoons together, or animated yes. cartoons together. Yeah. you know, it, it would or be especially because they're both in that same era. Mm -hmm. Exactly, they'd be perfect together. It would be fun, I think. Also, though, I am waiting for a a Batman comic book that's actually set in the 40s, and I'm not talking about gas Gaslight Batman by Gaslight. I'm not talking about that. I'm that's talking about. Brilliant. It's coming. Yeah. Ooh. Is it? Is it? Cool. There, there is a Superman Batman book coming out in March that is going to be set at the time of the serials. Oh. And you're going to have the villains from the serials in the in the in the comic with Superman and Batman. So oh, okay. it's very oh. golden ageish. I, I, like DC was just like, hey Mike, we wanted you to come back. Nah, I'm, I'm good, guys. It's, it's, it's good. How about if we put Batman and Superman in the serials in the radio show? Oh, I, I'm uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, you get yeah. back into this yeah. abusive relationship. It's okay. <laughs> I know, right? I need to be abused now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, guys, um, uh, we I, I guess we got to wrap up. Well, what uh, give? Um, uh, let, let's. Uh, one last recommendation for the Dick Tracy movie from everybody. Uh, what's a what's a thing that I, I mean, I I'm guessing it might be streaming somewhere. I I don't know off the top of my head. It's not on Disney Plus yet, but should be. Um, maybe it will be eventually. They'll dig it out of the archives at some point. But uh, Denise, like, what's your favorite thing about the Dick Tracy movie? So if you know anything about me, you know I'm a huge uh, antique person. I love the old radio shows. I have a bunch of antiques sitting in my uh, dining room right now. And uh, my favorite time periods to research and the ones that I'm the most knowledgeable in history is World War One and World War II. I was actually born on the anniversary of D-Day. Uh, so yeah, it made, I used to get all of the great History Channel programming when I was a kid. Um, which was super great. But uh, so for me, just the the aesthetic and the feel of Dick Tracy, the fact that you can be transported into this car or this this cartoon, this comic strip, this this certain time and certain place, and it's so bright and so colorful, and it's just fun. And and I love the aesthetic. I, I adore the aesthetic. And you should just watch it because of that reason. It's such a shock. And then from that shock, it becomes fun. Keith? Uh, this isn't actually a favorite thing about it, but it's sort of a warning I want to put out to anybody who is watching this panel and decides, hey, I should watch Dick Tracy again. There is one aspect of the film that has aged very badly, which is when Tracy is interrogating Mumbles. Oh, boy. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. that that you got you got to go into this knowing, the A, the period when it was made, which was, you know, pre Rodney King for crying out loud, um, mm. and also the era in which it's supposed to take place, which is basically the twenties and thirties, even though yeah. they don't explicitly say that. Um, the, you know, like 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 we were saying before, this is Tracy is really prohibition era policing, um, and you have to go in with that in mind. Uh, it's it may not, like I said, a lot of that stuff has not aged well, particularly the the, the, the interrogation. Well, up so far, yeah. Be aware of that going in. Because uh, yeah. that, 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 that caught me off guard when I rewatched it for my... For okay, my yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I was like, mm -hmm. and it kind of threw me out of the movie for a bit. But. <laughs> Gary? Yeah, I, I would second that. For me, it's like, it's it does have flaws. The plot, it, it weirdly feels rushed and drags at the same time. <laughs> um, 
It's a but weird it, juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. But it's got some great performances. It's got fantastic music. It's got incredible makeup. And it's it's definitely worth a watch if you're a comic book fan or, you know, if, if you like nine, 80s movies, which even though it came out in 90, it's an 80s movie. It's an 80s movie. It yeah. totally is. Yeah. Uh, and I do have to point out the fact that it won three Oscars. It won uh, for production design. It won for uh, best makeup. And it got best original song. Uh, sooner or later, I get always get my man. And, which really? Taught, Not yes. Hanky Panky? Nope. Oh, which uh, makes it tie with uh, Black Panther for the most Oscars won for a comic book movie. Nice. Huh? Nice. Well, now I'm bummed out that my cassette liner <laughs> notes do not have the lyrics to Hanky Panky. Oh, but, my uh, God. Joe. The rest of us, however, are relieved. Yes, <laughs> we are. <laughs> Michael, no, Michael what's your Mayo. favorite um, I, I just... One, I, I love the score. It's got a Danny Elfman score before Danny Elfman became too Danny Elfman. It's just like it was you just got starting a little, to become Danny. Elfman. Yeah, you got a little yeah. Batman, but not as much as like his Darkman score. Uh, but I, I agree with everybody that it's fun. And what I would suggest is it, it's super cheap on on Amazon. Buy this, buy the Rocketeer, buy the Shadow, and buy the Phantom. And yeah. have yourself a fantastic afternoon. Yes. yes. Get a big thing of popcorn and yeah. just enjoy it. <laughs> what about you, Joe? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, thank you. Yeah, hold on. <laughs> yeah, I guess he did already answer that. I guess I did. Because <laughs> um... when I think about Joe, I think about Hanky Panky. Thank you. Mm. Because, well, we yeah. because Gary, as, uh, as we all know, there is nothing like a Good spanky. Okay. Oh um, my anyway. God. Why? Why do I know the lyrics immediately? Look, well, I know I, I have most of the rap from the end of Monster Squad memorized. So okay. you are you are not okay. in this alone. And, and right. can we all give Michael a moment to, to go awe over to dog? Oh dog. <laughs> he's so cute. Yeah, she uh she 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 gets a little heavy in my lap and Aww. she's not feeling well tonight. So Okay. So, but guys, let's uh, go around the around the internets and everybody tell everybody where you can be found if you wish to be found. Denise. Yeah. So I'm on Instagram. I'm not very active right now because I'm in the middle of completely redesigning and retooling my Instagram um, to uh, start teaching people history. Uh, because again, it is my favorite subject and it's something that I've been passionate about ever since I got in, or well, ever since I was a kid. And uh, when I got into the argument with my 12th grade English teacher on the origin of the Trojan War, I got a C in that class. I don't understand why. Son of a bitch. I know it was awful, but he was wrong. Anyway, you can find me on Instagram right now at layman's terms. And uh, hopefully in the next few months, I will be a lot more active and you will get uh, easy history lessons that are akin to the meaning of the term layman's terms. Ah, see what I did there? It's clever. Ah. I think. <laughs> nah, Keith. You can find me online at decendido.net, which is my horribly primitive website that I am hoping will finally be brought into the 21st century in 2021. Um, you can also find me on Facebook, on Twitter. There are links at decendido.net. I'm also on Instagram. Um, I write for tour.com, uh, including the superhero movie rewatch where I talk about both all the Dick Tracy movies. Uh, and also I have a Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash crad, K-R-A-D, my initials. Uh, I write movie reviews, TV reviews, vignettes featuring my original characters, uh, excerpts from my works in progress, and most important of all, cat pictures. Yes. Lots and lots of cat pictures. So <laughs> patreon.com slash crad. It's, it's dirt cheap and you help me pay bills and you get cool content. So. I love, I love, uh, Keith, you are a genius. Buy this man's books. Buy put, his books. He, look, like the, the the man put his cat photos behind a paywall. That's mm. <laughs> well, you gotta pay for the never mind, I'm not gonna finish that. <laughs> it's only two bucks a month for the cat photos. But Michael Bailey. Uh Fortress of Bailey com, where you can find what I laughingly refer to as the Fortress of Bailey Tude Podcasting Network. I it's just a place where all of my shows are uh, held because 
it's a lot easier than saying go here, go here, and go here. Uh, I talk about comic books at a ridiculous pace. I'm trying to branch out a little bit and talk about other things. Uh, also, every most Tuesday nights, we're coming back uh, next Tuesday. I am on WGBS Live over at the Superman homepage mm. where Steve Eunice and I, if the technology holds, uh, talk about uh, whatever is new in the world of Superman at that moment. And what do you have behind your paywall? <laughs> uh, see, I have a Patreon, but because of my real job, I cannot produce content for extra. So it's more of a tip jar oh, than uh, nice. than anything else. It's just like, look, if you know, and I and I ask for a dollar. It's not like I'm 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 asking for anything significant. Though if I do hit three hundred dollars a month in, in, in patrons, which is never going to happen. I, I did say I would do a commentary for Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, the ultimate edition. Uh, mm. I set that high price so that I would never have to do it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm just I, looking forward to I next live break time where I can to support you. you for the balance of it just for one month <laughs> to make you do month. that. <laughs> All right, everybody. So two things out of this panel. Hashtag release the baby cut and get this man $300. Yeah, I feel, I feel like I feel like uh, all of us in the classics track, we, we need to start a pool for the $300 yeah. so we can give it to Michael. That way we can have that yeah. commentary. I feel like I just this wanna, is I just want to I just want you to do it on StreamYard on video so we can watch the veins in your forehead. <laughs> so you can watch me slowly slowly go insane. I, I think that would be the audio version of it. It's just like no one will be seated during the cop scene that was so important to put into the film. <laughs> we can watch your soul slowly die. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we could timestamp it and here's where you can see his soul leave his body. <laughs> <I'm fair. laughs> and uh Gary Mitchell uh, here inside this box every week with him over there. Uh, you can find me on the Twitter here. One of these days I'll figure out how this camera works. <laughs> We've only been doing this since June. <laughs> Please, Gary, come on. Or even older. I don't even, when was the first one, Joe? I don't remember I anymore. March. March. Yeah. March. Time has no meaning anymore. Time has no meaning. <laughs> Yeah. December 37th, 2020. That's right. That's where we are. June 6th was a year ago, guys. <laughs> the 13th level of Jumanji, ladies and gentlemen. We really are. We really yeah. are. We but that's, that's, that's where you can find me, here or here. And uh, yeah. tune in next week. Our panel is going to be about a discussion with Sue Kaisenweather of Is She a Mary Sue? <gasps> oh, am I on that panel? I will you can be. Posted. I think so, yeah. but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're do trying to do an all lady panel for that one, except well, for me. I, and Karen, I, so I mean, I, last time I checked, I'm a lady. Hi. You know, I've got nothing that will get me except an HR, so I will just. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, I'm gonna I'm gonna remove myself from this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but guys, oh, thank you, Rocky. Thank you very much. Yeah, look at that. Thank you, Rock. Uh, but. But guys, thank you. We love all of us assembled here. We love doing these things every single week. Uh, we are going to be back, like like Jerry said, in seven days. We're going to be back and doing something else. And um, if you want to come see me in person, this Saturday I'm a pro wrestling announcer in oh. Gadsden, Alabama. But uh, in the meantime, in seven days, you can come see me uh, doing this thing. Uh uh, it's it's the same. It's the same thing. Um, oh, yeah. Pro wrestling and sci-fi are very similar. But, guys, thank you very <laughs> much for carving out a chunk of your time on, th on Thursday nights from the psycho bonker insanity of reality and yeah. um, hanging out with oh, us. Yeah. And we will see you very, very soon. On Follow us on the YouTubes. Follow us on Facebook. Uh, like us, Twitters. subscribe us, and um, we will see you very soon. And we join us, please, next week when Gary Mitchell says, "Well, I suppose she might be a Mary Sue since her name is Mary Sue, but I don't think she's a Mary Sue." <laughs> okay, I like it. I like it. <laughs>